Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here virtually for this talk. Um, my name is Juliana Rangel. I am Associate Professor of uh, Apiculture at Texas A&M University. And today I wanna talk to you about the nutritional ecology of honeybees in a changing landscape and some of the work that we've been doing at our lab um, regarding nutrition. Most of the work that we've been doing has been um, led by our PhD candidate, Pierre Lau, whom you probably know because he's given a lot of talks and he's kind of on his last um, year of his PhD. But um, more recently, we started a collaboration with uh, my colleague in the Department of Entomology, Dr. Spence Beamer, who is um, a very well-known insect nutritional ecologist and his postdoctoral research associate, uh, Dr. Pierre Lenz. Uh, we also have had a very important participation of beekeepers from the Texas Beekeepers Association and from the Austin area beekeepers, as you will see shortly. So uh, first I wanna talk about the building blocks of honeybee nutrition. Uh, those are nectar, which is the source of carbohydrates or sugar uh, for the colony, and it is the source of energy. Pollen, which is the source of protein, and it also provides lipids, vitamins, my, uh, minerals, so macro and, and micronutrients that help with um, body construction, uh, brood rearing, and colony maintenance. And of course, water for hydration and also for um, keeping the temperature inside the colony regulated when it's really hot through evaporative cooling. So let's go through each one a little bit more in detail. Nectar foraging um, is the activity of collection of nectar from floral or extra floral nectaries. Um, hopefully you can see my, that my cursor here, but there are some flowers that don't have nectar in, in the flower itself, but in these little extra floral nectaries that produce honeydew that sometimes uh, honeybees and other insects consume for um, sugar production. Floral nectar is an aqueous plant secretion that contains between five and 80% of sugar content and mostly sucrose, glucose, and fructose. And the specific mix varies from plant to plant. So there's no two plants that have specifically the same ratios of these sugars. Some sugars like galactose, mannose, and rhamnose are actually either toxic to honeybees or can cause reduction in longevity. So not all uh, plant sugars are made equally or are as beneficial to honeybees as others. Uh, honey is the actual uh, processed nectar that col uh, colonies uh, create to store for the thin or winter months. So the nectar um, foragers come back to the nest uh, with nectar carry carried in their honey crop or honey stomach. And then um, they, when they regurgitate it back to unloader honeybees, they process that nectar with hypopharyngeal gland enzymes um, that include diastase, invertase, and glucose oxidase that start the conversion process from nectar to honey. And so it helps to break down the sugars into monosaccharides. It also uh, adds uh, hydrogen peroxide for antimicrobial protection. And the unloader bees, uh, when they process this regurgitated nectar back into the cells uh, for storage, they start an evaporation process so they can reduce the high uh, water content in the uh, nectar to about only 18% or less to prevent uh, yeast growth in the honey. Once the honey is what we call ripe or ready, it is capped with a fresh layer of wax uh, when the uh, substance is at the right water concentration. Now let's move on to pollen. Pollen is the male germaplasm of plants. It co-evolved with flowering uh, plants um, and honeybees and other um, pollinators co-evolved with these plants so that the uh, plant can provide the nectar and pollen for nutrition of the pollinators and in turn, the pollinators will provide a pollination service going from plant to plant and allowing for um, the sexual reproduction of plants. Typically, pollen contains between 6 and 28% of protein 
and about 5% of lipids and sterols, which are essential for metabolism. For example, um, bees and other insects, they do not um, um, create uh, cholesterol de novo in their body. So they need the um, sterols in the plants to create cholesterol and ectysteroids uh, for molting and other bodily processes. Now let's go on to bee bread. Bee bread is basically pollen that is packed into open cells, like you can see in this picture with different colors because it's containing pollens from different plants. And so the um, uh, pollen foragers come back and they unload their uh, contents of their pollen basket themselves into uh, cells, but then uh, the processing bees will be the ones that pack the pollen into the cells and so it helps to prevent germination of the pollen grains and the protein content in the pollen is preserved. Um, about 125 to 145 milligrams of pollen or about 30 milligrams of protein are needed to rear one worker larva. So you can imagine the amount, the vast amount of pollen that is needed to uh, produce, let's say a thousand or 10,000 larvae throughout uh, the year for a colony. So larvae pro are progressively fed by nurse bees and that's something very special about honeybees. And so these nurse bees that you see here in this picture are feeding the larvae progressively, meaning that um, every few hours and every um, day of the five larval days, they will continuously feed the larvae with different foods at different ratios of um, nutrients depending on the age of the larva. But it, it contains, this larval food contains secretions of hypopharyngeal and mandibular gland contents. Of course, some pollen and honey that is fed directly to older larvae um, in their fourth and fifth instarts, but mostly it is secretions uh, from the hypopharyngeal and mandibular glands of the nurse bees, who are the ones that eat the bee bread to then turn into worker food larva. So they will um, produce uh, secretions from here, their mandibular glands, here's their tongue, um, and their for hypopharyngeal glands. Um, and so that's why they need to eat so much um, uh, bee bread. So uh, brood food for workers is a rate, has a ratio of two to nine to three mandibular hypopharyngeal gland secretions and pollen. That's the roughly the, um, the uh, secretion content for brood food. And the emergence weights and times for uh, worker larvae are affected by the amount and quality of the food they receive. So adults break down their own tissue to feed the larva in times of starvation, for example. If there isn't enough food and there's um, already been some brood food uh, produced, um, the, um, the size of the uh, developing larvae is not the same and sometimes um, the adults will actually start eating up or using up their own fat body contents to feed larvae. For example, there's also uh, larval cannibalism during starvation times in some colonies. So you can have cannibalism and early capping of larvae uh, as a strategy for honeybees uh, in times of experimental pollen shortage. So here in this graph, you can see periods uh, here in the y-axis, we have the amount of daily mortality of workers. Here's the uh, larval age um, of those uh, developing larvae. We have uh, here in the dotted line times where there is foraging uh, available for the foragers to go and get. And here's the time when there is no foraging periods. And as you can see easily, more than 60% of young larvae can die um, uh, when there is no food uh, available and it's mostly because there is experimental pollen shortage in this particular example. And so the, uh, wor the adult workers start cannibalizing on uh, larvae so that they can have their own pollen or protein source and they don't have to feed the very expensive larvae to produce. So, and oh, uh, on top of that, the worker larvae are capped about six hours earlier than normal, meaning that they don't get fed as well. Um, and so they're gonna have smaller size upon emergence and shorter longevity. 
And so they cannibalism and this oophagy or egg eating, which is also a way of cannibalizing on protein sources, happens until day four of larval development. As you can see here in this line, it drops on day four, which is um, the time of growth and, and food consumption in larval development of honeybee workers. In terms of adults, adults either do auto feeding or they do food sharing uh, or trophallaxis. So they can find, as if you've seen in your colonies, adults that will um, uh, um, extend their uh, proboscis or tongue out to consume some dripping honey from your colonies or nectar, or they will perform this food sharing behavior. Uh, where one bee will regurgitate back some contents of food, either from their crop or from their um, their uh, elementary system to feed other bees. Um, and so they mostly feed each other nectar or honey as energy sources. And they also feed on pollen or bee bread for growth and development, especially in nurses for the development of the hypopharyngeal and mandibular glands, but for older adults just to keep up with metabolic uh, rate needs and, and normal physiology and aging. And so the nutritional needs of adults uh, change with age. So why is nectar so important for honeybees? And that's uh, uh, one of our um, pictures of uh, our very popular Aggie honey from A&M. So Long-term provisioning and food preservation uh, enables colonies to survive fears of nectar death, dearth, and that's uh, one of the reasons why the uh, bees will dehydrate the, uh, the water content in nectar and then put a capping of wax uh, over the ripe honey so that it prevents um, infection um, and it allows for preservation of the food in the winter when there's nothing blooming and they still need to consume food. Um, and that is because it's very costly to be alive and perform all of the necessary tasks. So a worker larva needs about 142 milligrams of honey to develop and adults need about four milligrams of sugars per day for survival. And if you multiply that by 30, that can be 120 milligrams just for survival. In terms of, of pollen and how uh, bees feed on pollen types from all kinds of blooming flowers, there is a field that has a very long name. It's called melissopalynology, which is the study of pollen that is contained in honey to understand honeybee foraging ecology. The taxonomic uh, group of pollen indicates that the bees, um, what the bees ate. Uh, so whatever pollen is on the uh, hind leg, uh, pollen basket, or corbicula of a uh, honeybee worker will tell you after identification what the bees were feeding on at uh, specific times of the year. And it also gives us some important consumer value because the um, honey that is contained in, sorry, the pollen that is contained in honey um, gives um, researchers and beekeepers an idea of exactly what type of nectar was in um, uh, was being collected at, particular, um, at a particular time when honey was made um, by bees. So for example, you go to the grocery store and you find um, something like this where it says clover honey. So um, most of the honey um, came from clover plants. And one of the reasons is because they know that the bees were in these huge um, monocultures of clover for clover honey production. And also because if you look at the uh, traces of pollen that's in the honey, you will find a lot of clover pollen. You also have these um, more expensive honeys like sourwood honey that uh, occurs in the Southeastern US and you only find it in certain times of the year. You have to have a specific amount of pollen present in that honey uh, through some melissopalynological analysis to uh, determine that it is actually sourwood honey. And even more importantly, uh, with very expensive honeys that come from very specific plants like manuka honey in New Zealand and now Australia, it's the most expensive honey in the world because it has so many antimicrobial and anti uh, wound healing properties that it has to, there are some regulations in those countries where um, there has to be a minimum amount of uh, manuka plant 
pollen in the honey uh, to be able to call it manuka honey, which uh, brings uh, a lot of value to the beekeeper. So most leading honey producing nations in the world require accurate labeling of honey. We don't have that in the United States, um, but in most countries, there, there's actually laws that prevent people from misleading the consumer in terms of what type of nectar uh, the bees collected to produce the honey that the consumer is um, paying for. So to do that analysis of um, uh, the type of pollen that's either in uh, the pollen baskets of honeybees um, to see what they collected in terms of pollen or to look at the pollen that is contained within honey for this kind of uh, honey analysis, you do a process called acetolysis. Um, it, you have to do this in the laboratory. It, uh, you add to your honey solution or, or a homogenized pollen pellet. Um, you take a nine to one solution of acetic anhydride and sulfuric acid. It's quite uh, flammable, so you have to do it in the laboratory. And what this process does is it kind of, um, breaks down the kit or the, um, or the shell of the pollen grains and thus exposing the morphological features of each pollen grain, uh, allowing for adequate examination of, of that pollen grain used for identification. And what we mean by that is that before acetolysis, the pollen kit or this, um, this kind of uh, shell that these pollen grains are covered by to protect the pollen grain, um, uh, make these pollen grains look very similar to each other. Both of these types of pollen are, belong to the rose family, Rosaceae, but they're actually in different genus. Um, and of course there are different species, but they look very similar. But once you acetalize the pollen and the pollen kit is broken down, then you start seeing these morphological features of each pollen grain that make it these pollen grains look different from each other. Once you have those features exposed to, through the acetolysis process, <coughs> and then you can um, also do some measurements on these uh, sizes of the openings and the average size of these pollen grains, you can start comparing these data to um, pollen atlases and different uh, source files that you have to start analyzing the pollen either to the family or down to the genus or even down to the species type. So that um, melissopollenological analysis or the palynology analysis of, of what bees collect um, can be very time consuming because as you can imagine, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of um, flowering plants that honeybees can um, be foraging from uh, during a season. So this is just an example of one of those slides, uh, glass slides with the contents of an acetalized um, homogenized pollen uh, sample from uh, bees that collected pollen in a given time of year. And so uh, right away you can see the different shapes and coloration uh, that resulted from the acetalized pollen. So this pollen comes from magnolia in the magnoliaceae family. This one, small one here, is from willow. This one here is very common around here, uh, especially in the um, spring and summer, crepe myrtle. And this is sweet clover, which is um, in the fabaceae family or, or the um, uh, legume family. So, um, Pollen brings um, honeybees a lot of macronutrients, including proteins, lipids, and even carbohydrates. It also provides micronutrients like minerals, vitamins, and as I said earlier, uh, sterols that they need uh, because they do not synthesize cholesterol uh, from their own bodies. Workers do not have consider considerable protein or lipid reserves in their bodies. They use them up re rather quickly, so they always need a constant um, uh, availability of um, protein sources. Especially 
um, because they need to um, increase the production of vitellogenin, which is a glycolipoprotein, uh, which is female specific uh, and it's an egg yolk protein for oogenesis or, or the production of eggs. For example, uh, honeybee queens have to have high levels of vitellogenin during um, egg laying. Um, and it's produced in the fat bodies of honeybees, which circulates in the hemolymph or the blood of the honeybees at the, and at the production site, which is the fat body. So honeybees can be either what we would call skinny bees or healthy fat bees. And these are the um, fat bodies of a, this, of a healthy honeybee com, uh, compared to the fat bodies of a very skinny, poorly um, fed on worker honeybee that doesn't have fat bodies uh, or very little. And that means that they do not have enough um, uh, production of vitellogenin for egg production and or also um, food production for, um, for brood rearing. Pollen is very important for hormone signaling, for foraging behavior, immunity, including antioxidative functions, stress resistance, and longevity in honeybees. In fact, um, it's been found that um, the glucose oxidase activity uh, of bees that are fed uh, different diets um, is, is very different in bees that feed uh, from uh, monofloral diets. So they, honeybees have a better antioxidative function ability and a higher production of glucose oxidase for the immuno response against um, infections and other, um, other um, uh, health risks when they feed on a multifloral uh, food source compared to a protein poor diet. Finally, I wanna just briefly mention um, the importance of water to honeybees. So if you see honeybees um, in your pond or um, by your creeks, that is because they actually enjoy the minerals uh, that they find in this kind of brackish dirty water. Water is used for temperature regulation, metabolic needs and the creation of larval food. And it contains salts that are found to be essential for brood food provided by the nurse bees. And they prefer dirty water over clean water. So it's not surprising that they might go to your swimming pool instead of your very clean water faucet. And that's because your water in the swimming pool can, pool can have um, some minerals that the bees are actually uh, needing for um, their metabolic needs. So I gave you um, uh, kind of a, an overview of the um, nutritional needs of honeybees at different levels of, of development, uh, what the larvae feed on, especially we're talking mostly about workers. We have some differences in nutritional needs of the reproductives. For example, the queens during development are feed royal jelly, which is a brood food that contains um, higher levels of specific proteins like royal lactin uh, and have about 30% more sugar. So they eat more of that food, but we didn't really have time to go over queen uh, diet and also drone diet. They have, um, they feed a little bit more on this brood food um, that is provided to the developing workers. And they, the nurse bees, um, uh, are the ones that feed the lar developing larvae. And so in order to feed with those hypopharyngeal gland, mandibular gland um, uh, secretions, they need to feed on fresh bee bread. Um, they need to have uh, carbohydrate sources like nectar. They have to have enough water. They have to have a very nutritious bee bread so they can um, create all of the, provide all the essential amino acids that are needed uh, for proper um, brood rearing. And so all of these activities are happening inside the colony and outside of the colony, you have uh, the nectar foragers and the pollen foragers and the water foragers that are bringing all the uh, essential um, uh, nutrients in the colony. As you can see here, the dotted line means trophallaxis or food sharing that is happening be between the inside and the outside bees. And the solid lines are directed uh, deposition or consumption by those individuals of the specific source. So there is trophallaxis and direct 
feeding or deposition at every level uh, inside and outside of the colony. And, um, and that is all well maintained in, in a kind of an, a homostatic um, uh, equilibrium in the colony. Now I want to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in terms of um, nutrition in the colony. And in particular, uh, for our lab, we're more interested in uh, protein or pollen nutrition. So the first um, study uh, led by, um, by Pierre, but was a multi-state study with uh, collaborators from several universities and organizations was um, looking at the seasonal variation of pollen collected by honeybees in developed areas, so in um, urban and suburban uh, landscapes around the United States. So for this study, we had urban beekeepers that participated by allowing us to sample their colonies. So we had 15 sites per state in California, Texas, Michigan, and Florida. And within Texas, mostly um, uh, beekeepers that belong to the Austin Area Beekeepers Association and also a few beekeepers here in the Bryan College Station area. We had a minimum of two colonies per site. Um, and then we confirmed the site location with GIS. Um, this was done a few years ago. We also confirmed through GIS and landscape um, analysis, composition analysis, that the, uh, each site was <clears throat> at least 78% developed, uh, meaning urbanized. And uh, once we collected the pollen from these bees, that were um, throughout the year. So we sampled from every uh, colony um, once every month for 12 months, unless it was in the winter months. Um, we collected these homogeneous samples uh, from each colony and we summarized the data by categorizing the pollen abundance based on an old but important paper by Lovo and, and, uh, and others in 1978, where they uh, had a pollen sample and they identified the pollen they're in and then decided whether there were any pollens that uh, were represented in over 45% of the pollen um, grains uh, analyzed. Those were the predominant uh, types. Secondary pollen types were the ones uh, in which only 16 to 45% of the pollen uh, that was analyzed belonged to that specific pollen group. Then we had important minor groups, three to 16% of, of the pollen grains counted belong to that specific um, taxonomic group. And then the minor pollen types were um, the pollens that had um, only less than 3% of the pollen analyzed um, belong to those groups. And we separated uh, our data into the four seasons, summer, fall, winter, spring, um, uh, using our standard uh, calendar for measuring um, or segregating into seasons. And so I'm going to show you just the results here in Texas because we're interested, most interested in Texas, um, uh, just to give you an idea of, of the type of analysis that was done. So here in Texas, uh, we have three seasons. We did not have um, data from the winter. There were not uh, blooming flowers during the winter times that were enough to deem um, this as an appropriate analysis. So we have um, summer, fall, and spring. And so as, as I showed or said earlier, uh, we are following this predominant secondary important minor or minor uh, group segregation. And so here we have in the y-axis the pollen type abundance from zero to 100%. And that means 100% of the total pollen grains that were analyzed in each sample, which was about uh, 500 grains um, at least um, per sample. And so for example, here in the, in the summer, we had um, a predominant group, so it, almost 80% of the um, pollen analyzed for, for the fall, uh, sorry, in the summer uh, was crepe myrtle. So very important um, pollen source in the urban areas of, of Central Texas, uh, crepe myrtle uh, in the Lithracia family. 
Then we have three important minors, um, the most important uh, clover in the Fabaceae family, but we also have the Aracaceae and the Nardicaceae family. Um, uh, comb, for example, is in the Aracaceae family. And then we had a total of 11 minor pollen types, meaning that each one of these out of the 11 contributed less than 3% of the total number of pollen grains that were analyzed. In the fall, uh, things switched completely. We had a uh, great availability of elm pollen in the fall followed by a secondary group, um, in, which is the daisies in the Asteraceae family. We still had um, uh, crepe myrtle being an important minor pollen type in the fall. And then we had again, 11 minor groups. And in the spring, things are very different. We have mostly um, a, a secondary group. And we did not have any predominant groups in the spring. So there was a lot more variability and variety of foods available. And they consumed as a secondary type uh, sumac, which is in the Anacardaceae family. And we had a bunch of, um, of uh, important minor groups, including roses and oaks. Uh, and then uh, a really long list of uh, minor types, a total of 28 for uh, the spring in in uh, Texas. So that shows the, the wide uh, availability of floral types that um, bees consume pollen from in the spring here in Texas. Of course, this was different for every location in California, Michigan, um, and Florida, but this is just to give you an idea of the type of analysis this, that was done for this study. So, um, as I hope to have convinced you, um, honeybee health is uh, very um, dependent on nutrition. If you look, and, and more and more studies are being done nowadays, looking at the effects of nutrition and the role of nutrition in honeybee health. So here you have a, a list of the publications from 1989 to 1992, um, and the topics that they uh, were uh, uh, mostly done on, uh, mostly including Varroa because uh, Varroa had just been around for about 10 years um, at that time. Uh, but now things have switched from 2013 to 2016 when this study was done. Um, we see a switch of fewer studies on, on pathogens, although we still continue uh, actually doing a lot of work on viruses but uh, definitely resource availability um, and, and habitat loss and nutrition uh, have become very important for our understanding of honeybee health. Um, and so as uh, Jerry Wright, a very important nutritional uh, biologist for honeybees um, out of Oxford University has said, the nutritional basis of pollen supplements is poorly understood and a more rational approach based on honeybee ecology and physiology is needed for us as beekeepers to understand really what bees are needing to consume to have a healthy colony. And um, in particular for our lab, we're now interested in seeing whether there are any correlations between the type of food that bees are consuming um, throughout the year and the role of this um, nutritional um, health on how they can combat uh, pests and or pathogens. And so we know that um, there are several factors that are affecting honeybee colony losses in the United States. These are um, some of the most important ones, queen failure, poor nutrition, pests and pathogens and management practices. And perhaps some of the management practices is that we're not really doing the um, uh, the right type of supplementation of colonies in times of dearth so that they can have better nutritional um, uh, availability throughout the year. And so to look at this kind of, uh, of work, we are, uh, as I said at the very beginning, co collaborating with Dr. Spence Beamer, who's a nutritional ecologist that has been studying insect uh, nutritional requirements for decades. And so he uses what is known as the geometric framework for nutrition, which is a state space modeling approach that explores how animals can solve the problem of balancing, ba balancing multiple and changing nutrient needs in a multidimensional and variable nutritional environment, which is the case for honeybees because 
they are foraging outside uh, from flowering plants that are blooming at different times of the year and in different regions around the world. So if you're uh, studying uh, the geometric framework for nutritional ecology, you can think of um, what an individual eats in a two dimensional space where you can have on the X axis, any type of macro or micronutrient that the individual is consuming in this case protein. And in the Y axis, another one that you're comparing it to in this case, it would be carbohydrates. So for this particular um, individual, as an example, we are providing two different diets, one that has uh, in the in the yellow line, one that has a low amount of protein but has a high amount of carbohydrate, one in the blue that has a high amount of protein but a low amount of carbohydrate. And if you provide this individual with a choice between the high carbohydrate or the high protein diet, you will start seeing that they will move in this two dimensional um, feeding space so that they choose the best possible diet. Um, and that uh, helps them improve their, our, their health. So this type of environment uh, geometric framework analysis is used to determine how macronutrient ratios, for example, the protein to carbohydrate ratio affects survival and physiology in individuals. So we are interested in learning about what the optimal macronutrient ratio is in honeybees. Um, so we want to determine an optimal honeybee macronutrient ratio in a controlled diet. And in our case, we're looking at protein to lipids, not necessarily carbohydrates. So our null hypothesis are, is that honeybees do not regulate their nutrient intake and consume macronutrients without a bias. So they don't really make any determination of what they're consuming. They just eat randomly whatever is available to them at a particular time. But the interesting test hypothesis in our experiment is that honeybees regulate their diet consumption to adjust the nutritional imbalances and choosing and picking what they want to eat more of in order to improve um, their nutritional health. So to do that, we have conducted a few of uh, field no choice experiments with five frame nucleus colonies to determine if bees are foraging for pollen in equal amounts when only given one type of pollen. Basically, a no choice test where we are providing them um, in tents so that they don't have access to any food on the outside. We give them um, either one of two treatments. Uh, our experiments are done with uh, brassica pollen, which is uh, uh, basically canola um, pollen, which is very commonly used in honeybee by honeybees. And we also give them an also uh, another uh, common pollen source, which is rose. And so in, in our tents, we um, provided these nucleus colonies, which we standardized for size um, with nine dishes containing only brassica pollen in a, in a, in a um, petri dish with water. Or in another tent, uh, we had nine dishes only containing rose pollen or water to see what they like to consume most. And so uh, our um, no choice tests showed that um, the bees, um, and these are separated by day. So we did this experiment over five total days and that's why you see a gradient of green shades here. Um, they, um, overwhelmingly preferred to consume uh, brassica pollen com uh, compared to uh, the consumption of rose pollen when they were only given uh, one or the other type. And so when you look at the protein and uh, lipid contents within each one of these protein uh, pollen types, um, the brassica and rose pollen have almost identical protein amounts but the brassica pollen has a huge amount of lipid, uh, more than twice the amount of lipid uh, compared to the rose um, pollen, which means that by eating more of that um, brassica pollen, they're also consuming a whole lot more uh, lipids uh, than, than with their rosa pollen. So they indeed have preferences for pollens that they like to eat better. But the more kind of in 
interesting test is the field choice test with these same types of colonies when you give them uh, the two types of pollen within uh, the test arena and you see whether um, they eat uh, the pollen types at in equal amounts or in different amounts. So we gave them this kind of the same test arena with nine dishes, but in one of the treatment groups, we gave them six rose dishes and only three brassica dishes. So um, um, three times as much um, um, uh, rose pollen over brassica pollen. And in the other treatment, we gave them, I'm sorry, I meant twice as much. And in the other treatment, we gave them twice as much brassica pollen compared to rose pollen. And that was the only difference between the treatment groups. And we found that regardless of the treatment type, either more or less of the brassica pollen available, they still consume so overwhelmingly more brassica pollen compared to the rose pollen. It didn't matter if there were a whole lot more uh, rose dishes in this treatment group here, they still ate um, the brassica pollen at more than four times the rate as they did the rose pollen, meaning that when they have a choice, they go for the type of pollen that they actually prefer. Um, and this is the geometric framework uh, rail where um, they consume um, almost roughly equal amounts of protein regardless of the um, of whether there were more or less uh, dishes with the pollen available at the test site. And this consumption of an increased amount of brassica was performed day after day. So they preferred to eat the brassica pollen every day of the test compared to the rose uh, pollen. So it's not something that they learned one day and then they chose to go for another one the following day. Uh, their preference was consistent throughout the five-day period. And so because of the amount of protein and lipid that is contained within the, um, the, each one of those diets, it seems to suggest that our bees are regulating their diet so that they consume about 1.3 amounts of pollen for every amount of lipid that they have in their diet. So they're regulating their uh, macronutrient intake to a PL ratio of 1.43 to 1. Now we have also created um, an experimental diet type where we, um, knowing that, that uh, the 1.3 to 1 PL ratio is the um, one that they prefer, we started manipulating the PL ratios of diets to see how bees react to eating these uh, PL um, diets. So this is actually the first artificial diet created for honeybees where the protein and the lipid content can be manipulated by still uh, maintaining the same consistency of the diet. This one actually here looks a little more, um, let's say, oily than these here, but this was an older picture where uh, we were still uh, perfecting the diets. But the consistency of these um, diets now is, is almost identical, which means that the bees will eat the diet um, or, or prefer not to eat the diet because they don't want to uh, consume that specific PL ratio and not because they don't, they dislike the consistency of the food that they're being offered. And so uh, we're now conducting a very interesting laboratory choice tests with caged bees. This is also done between Pierre and our other student, Alex Payne. <clears throat> where we take one day old bees and we put them in cages in cohorts of about 30 workers. And we, uh, we've done a choice and no choice tests. And so uh, just like we did in the field, we're giving these bees um, the um, uh, sucrose solution. And within these little containers, we're giving them um, uh, also um, some food, but at the bottom, I don't know if you see, there are some plastic queen cups that allow us to put those diets in there and allow to see what the bees are consuming. And then later on, uh, we are collecting the bees to um, 
do the hypopharyngeal gland uh, size analysis to see if the diet they're consuming is affecting um, how well they can uh, feed um, the young because all of the bees in these experiments are really young, which are um, equivalent to nurse age bees, which are the ones that have very de well-developed uh, hypopharyngeal glands for brood food production. So these bees were given a no choice test with one of five diets or a negative control, which means that no diet was provided, only sucrose. So again, these are the diets where we had a high protein uh, ratio, 35 to 15, another higher protein to lipid ratio of 30, 20, an equal PL ratio of 25 to 25, a high um, lipid ratio of 20 to 30 P2L, and then a higher lipid ratio of 15 to 35. And that's why you see that it's a little more oily in this um, higher oil ratio. And these are the results for the no choice test with KHPs. Um, here are the different diets. So the different ratios of PL, 15 to 35, 20 to 30, et cetera. And the amount of food collected uh, in milligrams of the diet per B over a seven day period, which is shown in the gradient of colors that you see in each one of the bars. So the diet that they liked the least um, was the 15 to 35 ratio or the high lipid, low pollen um, concentration um, diet. They preferred um, uh, overwhelmingly the 30 to 20 um, uh, diet. So extreme diets like the 15 to 35 or the 35 to 15 had the lowest lipid consumption overall. And here's the um, that um, nutritional uh, geometric frame or rail where you see uh, the overall protein and lipid milligrams per B that were collected in each one of the diets. And you have the diets here um, with the amount of protein and lipid. Um, and so um, there were significant differences in the amount of lipid. There was much lower lipid uh, consumed in the even the high lipid ratio uh, diet, which is interesting because they didn't like to consume that as much. And they also um, saw a lower lipid consumption in the other extreme of the diet with the high protein uh, to lipid ratio of 35 to 15. But overall, the preferred diet was this one in the no choice test. So again, they weren't offered a choice. They just gave the same diet to the same bees and just um, measured the amount of food consumed. The interesting ones are the laboratory choice tests with caged bees. So in this case, we're taking combinations of these five diets and give, giving them paired to the bees. Uh, and so looking at the bees choices when offered these two diets within the cage. So we measured the consumption of each diet daily for these uh, one to 10 day old bees in the cages. Um, and then we looked at whether they were consuming the diets at random. That means that they were consuming the same amount for both diets or if they were actually choosing one diet over the other. And indeed that was the case uh, only uh, for these two groups. So when they were offered the 20 to 30 versus the 35 to 15 pairing diet, they prefer overwhelmingly to eat the high protein uh, uh, diet compared to the high lipid diet. Um, they didn't really care so much when they were offered the same PL ratio compared to the high protein. So if you see different letters between them, that means that they're different statistically. Uh, but indeed, they liked to consume again, just like we saw in the previous test, overwhelmingly preferred to consume the 30 to 20 diet compared to, uh, when they were faced with the 20, 30 diet. So they preferred the high protein to lipid food compared to the high lipid to protein food. And here's the, um, um, the combined um, uh, diet choices. And we have three different groups here uh, for the three diets. Um, and they overwhelmingly prefer to eat the, um, in the triangle, the 
um, 30 to 20 diet compared to the um, 20 to 30 diet. And then finally, we're um, still in the process of analyzing this, but we have some um, preliminary results where we're looking at the hypopharyngeal gland size in these bees based on, on the diet they consumed. So we measured the hypopharyngeal gland in the caged bees after 10 days. So those bees are caged and then um, uh, dissected out. And those are um, these little... Um, balls or little grape looking um, uh, structures are called the acini and the singular acinus. So one is acinus, multiple are acini, and those are the acini. And if they're much larger in nine day old bees, which are nurse age bees than in first uh, one day old bees because they just came out. So they get very well developed in bees that are uh, appropriately of nurse size uh, or nurse age. And uh, here we have in the y-axis, the size of the acinus um, uh, of the bees in, in amongst all of these groups. And very interestingly, uh, again, in the diet that was most consumed, the 30-20 diet, the size of the acinus, so the hypopharyngeal gland was much larger in the bees that consumed the 30 to 20 diet. That means that this diet not only is preferred, but it also increases the size of the hypopharyngeal gland of the bees, um, which is um, in turn very important for, um, for brood rearing. Um, and in the red line, we have um, the amount of protein consumed, which is much higher, of course, because here we have the 30 is higher than the 20 in the PL ratio. So there was an increase in the protein consumed, um, uh, but not as much in the lipid consumed in the diets. And so um, the differences between these two diets here, if there's an NS means not significant differences in hypopharyngeal gland size, but these last three diets did have a higher hypopharyngeal gland um, uh, size. And in particular, the most striking one is the 30-20 diet, which is also the one that they consumed the most in all of those tests. So take home messages for, ex for our studies. This is the first artificial dry diet that has been created for honeybees that allow us to manipulate the PL ratio without disturbing the um, consistency of the diet very much. And there seems to be some lipid regulation in, in intermediate diets, the 25 to 25 and the 20 to 30 PL ratios. Um, the 35 to 15 may be slightly high in protein and the 15 to 35 is too high in lipid content. So they don't really like uh, those extremes as much. But in, in the choice test, the bees definitely regulated their diet with a 1.4 to 1 PL ratio. So a slightly higher protein than lipid amounts. And so our PL ratios from the study show a substantial difference in the ratios of currently available commercial pollen substitutes. As you saw, they don't, didn't really like the 35 to 15 diet, which means that there's um, uh, more than twice as much protein in the diet as there is lipid. And when you go to the store and look at pollen substitutes, um, uh, which provide not just protein, but also minerals and, and other nutrients um, that you give to your bees in times of dearth so that the nurse bees can fully develop their hypopharyngeal glands, a lot of the protein supplements that are available commercially have incredibly high amounts of protein. Um, they, they claim you know, that high protein meaning um, healthy bees, but that might not be the case because they might not like a diet that has as high protein content as other macronutrients. So that's something that we have to look into further. Now, um, uh, to finish, we are looking at the role of, um, of the diet in the defense against pathogens. In particular, uh, we're looking at Nozema, Serana, and the form wing virus infection. So we know that the form wing uh, virus is highly vectored by varroa mites and symptomatic uh, bees have crippled wings and they have a shorter lifespan. Um, and so it's a very cosmopolitan bee virus, uh, meaning that it's everywhere basically where varroa exists and it infects all individuals showing symptoms in the adults. The stressors in the colony like poor nutrition or other uh, pathogens or pesticide um, 
exposure can cause the virus concentrations to spike, but there can also um, be not just um, high levels of, of the form wing virus uh, due to the vector like Varroa, but also can be passed down from, um, from drones to the queens during uh, mating and then from the queen to the eggs um, and through food sharing at infected sources. The important part is that, as you know, there's no direct treatment available, so you can only treat the stressors and the parasites or requeen the colony and hope that the viral levels will go down with time. And the only type of prevention is have inspections, treat other diseases, keep other stressors low. Um, and so we're wondering if, if maybe one possible non-chemical way to treat um, these colonies when they're infected with viruses is to provide them with the appropriate diet. And so uh, we've um, de done some um, experiments now uh, where we're looking at the amount of food consumed in bees that are either infected with the form wing virus or not. And when they're infected with the form wing, they prefer that 30-20 diet that I showed you earlier. Uh, when they're not infected, they also prefer that 30 to 20 diet compared to the other diets. But, um, but so there's no difference in consumption of the diets um, when infected or not infected, they seem to prefer that, um, that same diet. But maybe that diet is helping these bees, not just um, infected, but all bees combat um, pathogens better. And uh, one reason why we think that might be is that we did the same type of cage experiments um, as I showed you before, but in this case, we looked at the 14 day survival of bees uh, when they were either fed uh, no diet, so just sucrose, when they were fed a very high protein to lipid uh, ratio diet, a high but not as high protein to lipid ratio diet, which is the one that, um, that bees seem to prefer, and then a high lipid versus protein uh, diet. And we have the survivorship or the um, percent of surviving bees over time. And we looked at this, as I said, 14 days and these bees were caged just like we did in the other um, cage studies. And in the red lines, you're gonna see the bees that were infected with the form wing virus versus the bees that were not infected. Um, so when, when we saw no diet given to these bees, uh, there was a significant lower survival of bees that were um, uh, infected with the form wing virus. The same happened with the 40-10 diet uh, with a very low p-value. Um, then we started losing um, significance between the in the survival between the infected and the non-infected diets, both at the 30-20 diet and at the 20-30 diet, meaning that um, bees are, are just as likely to die basically from the cage, uh, being in a cage over 14 days and natural, um, natural death than they are for being uh, subjected to the form wing virus. So that can give us an idea that perhaps the bees when feeding spe on specific diets, they can increase their survivorship when infected uh, with a virus. We're still in the process of analyzing these data um, we also have similar data for uh, Nozema sorana infection. And then we're looking at once we get these bees that uh, die day after day, we collect them and we're looking at gene expression to see if, um, if uh, gene expression in these bees is affected by the diet they consumed. And so some of the uh, overall or encompassing take home messages from this talk is that honeybees consume all of these uh, products, and I didn't talk about propolis, um, um, to regulate um, the nutritional needs inside the colony. And so um, the immune system is the most costly physiological system in insects, and it's uh, the one that we need to watch out for in terms of, of overall health. And an elevated immune response can lead to a reduced colony productivity. So we have to help these bees somehow by lowering their immune response and still being able to combat um, these pests and pathogens. And we can do that potentially through the, the food we provide to them or the food that's available to them um, uh, in nature. So it's critical for bees to have proper nutrition and access to nectar 
pollen and in, in terms of pollen, polyfloral um, diets of pollen so that they can have a wide variety of amino acids and all the macro and micronutrients that are present in pollen, um, including also water and the type of water that contains all the minerals that they need. So with that, I hope that I've convinced you that it is important to keep uh, a very um, uh, nutritious and diverse uh, pollinator, pollinator habitat because uh, what we see in honeybees is probably very similar in some other bee um, species out there. So I wanna thank you for your attention for the continuous support that you've given to our lab over the years. Um, I hope that everyone stays safe and still continue to uh, enjoy uh, the convention even in, in this uh, fun uh, virtual um, uh, system. So thank you again. I, I um, encourage you to visit us um, on our Facebook page. Um, we have over 4,700 followers and we hope that maybe next year we can all meet again in person. Uh, to do something like our queen wearing workshop but until then i hope um, you stay safe and enjoy the rest of the conference